Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brandon Fess, and on behalf of the Rochester Public Library's Local History and Genealogy Division, welcome to Martha Taylor Howard, Savior of 17 Madison Street. To conclude our series on women's rights and the suffrage movement, today we're going to talk about Martha Taylor Howard, the woman who made sure that Susan B. Anthony's home was preserved for posterity. Our speaker today is Jenny Lloyd. Jenny Lloyd grew up in England. During her 20 years as a corporate wife, she lived in Britain, Italy, and Mexico before moving to Rochester in 1980. After an eclectic teaching career, she got her PhD at age 52 and became a history professor at the College at Brockport, where she also directed the Women's Studies and History MA programs and chaired the history department. She has published four scholarly articles and a book about Methodist women preachers in 19th century England. Since her retirement in 2009, she has published Catching Maggie, the Runaway Shetland Sheepdog, an account of catching her dog after nine months in the run, In My Mind's Eye, a memoir of growing up on a farm in the west of England, and Expatriation, about her life in Italy and Mexico. Also since her retirement, she has taught courses in history and related topics at Oasis Rochester, an organization for those over 50, and at Penfield Recreation. She gives a talk at the Susan B. Anthony House once a year and volunteers in the House Archive. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jenny Lloyd. Thank you, Brandon. Um, in, case you were, uh, in case you're interested, where I lived in Italy is behind me. Um, okay, today I'm going to be talking about a woman who some of you, or maybe all of you, have never heard of, but whose life had an impact not only on the, her adoptive city of Rochester, but nationwide. That woman is Martha Taylor Howard, who, while in her 60s and relatively new to Rochester, decided to take on the considerable task of preserving the Susan B. Anthony House as what she called a shrine. Today, we take it for granted that the house and the museum are an important part of Rochester's history, but without Martha Taylor Howard, they might have been lost to posterity. I'm also going to talk a little bit about how her life fitted into changes in women's lives, and um, please, if you have questions or comments, um, use the chat feature. I became interested in Martha. Oh, incidentally, I have to read this because I'm old and I will forget words if I don't, sorry. Um, I became interested in Martha when volunteering in the Susan B. Anthony House Archive, when I, when I catalogued a large stuffed box of her press cuttings that I suspect no one had looked at for a long time, if ever. Most of the information in my talk comes from that and the five other boxes that con contain Martha's documents. Martha Taylor, where am I? Martha Taylor was born in 1875 on Old Oaken Bucket Farm in Westland, Massachusetts then a small farming town about 36 miles from Boston. Her family, descendants of the Adams family, why is that happening? Traced its ancestry back to the American Revolution. Her father, Samuel Law Taylor, was a respected member of the community and a successful farmer, range member, and writer of columns for the lo local weekly newsletter. Her mother, Alta Schellinger Taylor of Swedish ancestry, was a Lowell Mill girl and later became one of the first women elected to a school board after Massachusetts allowed women to vote in school board elections in 1879. Martha grew up in an intensely patriotic family of strong women, conscious of her position in their local world and aware of her responsibilities to the community. Her obituary stated, Patriotic to the core, Mrs. Howard felt a deep responsibility to preserve the ideals upon which this country was founded. That ultimately led her to Susan B. Anthony. Martha attended the local Westford Academy, then a private co-educational school that included among its alumni, Ellen Richards, the first woman to be admitted to MIT and one of the pioneers of domestic science as a discipline and Nettie Stevens, the geneticist who proved that sex was determined by chromosomes. In 1896, she enrolled in the all-female Mount Holyoke College in their literary concentration. She was class secretary and editor of the yearbook on the executive committee of the debating society and a member of the YWCA and the Athletic Association. 
She graduated in 1899, but stra stayed to complete an MA in 1901. Uh, these photos are um, provided by her uh, grandson, Jim Howard, who lives in Fairport. After graduation, Martha taught elementary school for a year before taking a position as professor of psychology at Western College in Ohio, an offshoot of Mount Holyoke. According to the weekly Westford Watch, uh, Watch Wardsman, she stayed there for a number of years and the college alumni honored her as a faculty member around 60 years later. Since her qualifications in psychology were limited to an undergraduate course, her position was probably temporary. There were few women qualified to teach psychology at the college level. The first woman to graduate with a PhD in psychology was seven years earlier. In 1890, in 1894, however, she was eventually replaced by someone with a PhD in the discipline and by 1906, she was back at Westford, in Westford. There she seems to have drifted a little. In 1908, she went with other Westford, friend, Westford friends on a three month tour of Great Britain with a side trip to France. Much later, when entertaining the British consul in Western New York, she remembered the many times that in, in, on this trip they were served tea and quote, thought it so romantic, so much time and formality was put into the serving. In Scotland, high tea included rabbit pie. Tea was a big uh, thing at the Susan B. Anthony house later too. She then spent over a year living with her cousin Gilbert Schellinger and his wife in New Jersey, probably working as a teacher. The Schellingers lived about 40 miles from Manhattan in Franklin, New Jersey, next to a town called Boundbrook, where a stock trader, George Howard, lived with his parents. They were farmers with land, land in the Catskills in New Jersey and a presence in the wool trade. George was an independent stock dealer in the outdoor curb exchange, described in an article in Munsey's magazine as a roaring, swirling whirlpool of largely unregulated outside trading. George and Martha must have met locally and fallen in love. Just take a break uh, here for a minute uh, to talk about a, a woman or oh, the new woman who was um, uh, uh, regarded as typical of Martha's middle class women ge generation. These were educated and self supporting middle class women who wanted careers in public roles. Um, the first generation was in the 1870s and 1880s. The second generation, which would be Martha, placed more emphasis on self fulfillment and rather less on public roles. Um, uh, riding a bicycle was very typical of these women. I actually don't know whether Martha owned a bicycle, but I suspect she did. In 1909, Martha and a friend drove across the country to California uh, before she returned to Westwood, perhaps to prepare for her wedding. Um, that was quite a journey uh, for, by car in 1909, another uh, example of her um, interest in exploring and having uh, interesting experiences. The 1910 census lists her as a school teacher who had been unemployed for 30 weeks, suggesting that she did indeed have a teaching position in New Jersey. In March, she stepped in to fill, uh, to fill a gap in the program of a local club. A topic which showed her interest in women's history was some noted women dealing with Elizabeth Fry, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and Alice Freeman Palmer, who was a major advocate for women's education. Martha and George married on June the 25th, 1910 in Westford at Martha's parents' home. She was, 20, she was 34, he was 37. It was a quiet wedding in contrast to the much larger affair when her younger sister Esther married in 1905. The rooms were decorated quote, with ferns, June roses, and beautiful pink laurel from the woods, and the congregational minister officiated. They seemed to have spent the month of July in Westford, not going on a honeymoon really, before leaving for New Jersey on, the, on a boat from Boston Harbor. There was a scare when the boat was struck by lightning shortly after leaving Boston, but there were no casualties. 
Martha and George Howard lived in Bound Brook for about 20 years. In the New Jersey census for 1915, um, they were living with George's family in a household with nine people. She was almost certainly involved in campaigning for the failed New Jersey women's suffrage amendment in 1915. Their son, George Taylor Howard, was born in 1914 in Westford, uh, where Mar Martha traveled for the birth. And in April 1918, their second son, Lawrence Salisbury, was christened, also in Westford. Lawrence died eight years later and was buried in Boundbrook Cemetery. Martha's grandson, Mark, told me that his father had said that Lawrence had scarlet fever. In Martha's surviving records, there's no mention of Lawrence at all. We know little about George and Martha's relationship. Where am I? But an incident Martha recalled in 1960 probably referring to the first time she voted in a national election in 1920 after the 19th Amendment was ratified, suggests a little about George's character. She noted that she was a rock rib Republican and he a Democrat, but he did not want me to change and I never tried to get him to change his party. We never had any word of words about politics. I voted first and then we, then we, had, when we, we had finished, when we had finished voting, he said to me, I voted Republican for the first time. I didn't want my vote to nullify yours. Martha's Republicanism was one of the type described by Catherine Rimpf as tending to, quote, view politics as an act of love or of civic duty. She came from Massachusetts, uh, she came from a solid Massachusetts Republican family and never questioned her allegiance, but her main loyalties were her to clubs and organizations just a word about Republican women. Um, uh, club women in particular, and I'll get, get, that, get back to that in a minute, um, believed that they could engage with party politics while retaining the separate women's institutions and distinct women's agenda that had served them in the past. So they, they gave their loyalty to their clubs first and uh, then to a political party, which for women, in the 1920s and 30s was still usually uh, the Republican part, what well, was usually the Republican Party, which was the party um, of Susan B. Anthony and the, and the suffrage movement most of the time. Uh, Susan B. Anthony did have a period of being a Democrat. According to George and Martha's grandson, George's for fortunes fluctuated in their bound brook years, and once, George, and once George Suit Jr. was sent to live with relatives, although perhaps that was after Lawrence died. At some point in the 1920s, the couple moved to 101 West 55th Street in New York City. By 1930, George Jr. was away at Deerfield Academy in Massachusetts, and Martha was listed in the census as a housewife. Probably George was badly hit by the 1929 crash, and in 1929 to 30 was likely the year he stopped trading um, independently and began working and began working as a customer's man um, for the brokers Bouvier and Company, which were the, uh, the uh, that was the Jacqueline Kennedy family's uh, brokerage firm. George's obituary described him as great. No, as, quote, of great business acumen and held in great respect because of his integrity, loyalty, and ability. But sadly, disaster struck back the family again. In 1931, George uh, contracted a rare, what, what was described as a rare and baffling disease and died in 1933 after 23 years of marriage. Martha was in her early 50s. Tragedy has stuck, struck Martha for the for third time in less than a decade. Her mother died in 1922, Lawrence in 1926, and now George. Years later, she very occasionally mentioned the effects of George's death. In a letter of condolence to another woman, she wrote, I try to live as seeing him who is invisible, and I try to do what he would expect me to do. She wrote to the will, uh, widow of Willard Luchner, longtime treasurer of the Sinners and B. Anthony Sound Foundation, quote, 
When my husband passed on, I was comforted by the thought that I could get al I could get along better than alone than he could if I had gone first. In another letter, more than 25 years after his death, she wrote, quite, I've tried to live as he would wish me to live and not sadden others. It's not clear how she was left financially in the years before Social Security. George Jr. was an undergraduate at Amherst and she was alone. Courageously, she decided to seek work as a free, freelance journalist. In an almost illegible draft of a letter, I wonderful and excellent training from women journalists at the, Tr the Tribune and New York Times, recalling a blue ribbon, uh, re receiving a blue ribbon for, quote, editorial excellence. She noted that she had had several articles printed in both papers and in the New York Sun, and that she'd been the press representative for several groups, likely women's groups, in the city for 10 years. She maintained her membership of the Women's Press Club of New York City until her death, and was often asked to, quote, say something when she visited from Rochester. She also found time for club work. She was a devoted member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, serving as president of the New York, she served as president of the New York City Colony of the National Society of New England Women and held office as Radio Award Chairman for the National Federation of Press Women. Meanwhile, George Jr. graduated from Amherst and, Har and, and Harvard Business School as an engineer, and he got a job at Kodak in 1939. Martha decided to move with him. He had been dating a woman Martha thought was unsuitable, and her granddaughter suggested to me that she wanted to keep an eye on, him, on whom he married. Together, they rented a house. 429 Seneca Parkway uh, for $45 a month. Martha arrived in Rochester in her mid sixties after a busy life in New York City. She knew no one and had no obvious role except mother of a grown son. But a consummate club woman, she had contacts. Shortly after she arrived in October of 1939, she gave a reception for three officers of the National Society of New England Women. She transferred her membership of the DI Daughters of the American Revolution from New Jersey, joining their committees for approved schools, uh, conservation and publicity, and becoming a regent. Her greatest allegiance was to those two organizations in which she held national office and attended nationwide meetings. They fed her ardent, ardent patriotism and her interest in both history and women's issues. She stated that having lineage entails with responsibility. If you have noteworthy ancestors, you should do something about it. However, they were hardly of the limit of her activism. She joined the Rundell chapter of the Delphian Society, an organization to encourage women's education through reading, was a seminar discussant on creative thinking and became their publicity person. Her obituary lists 15 clubs in which she held office. Those are just ones she held office, not necessarily the ones she belonged to. While her, while her activities in many others, like the local Friends of the Children or the Council of American Youth Hostels, can be tracked through the pages of the Democrat and Chronicle. In many cases, she acted as press officer and or radio officer, using the expertise from her years in New York City. A reporter maintained that she had quote, probably an all-time record as a press chairman. Judy Bennett, a journalist for the Democrat and Chronicle, Chronicle described her as, quote, a plump little rosy-cheeked woman with a wisp of white hair tucked into a flower-trimmed hat, who was nevertheless a damn good news source, always accurate, concise, and relevant. Uh, club women were, uh, of women's clubs were very important uh, to the uh, two women between the two world wars. Um, the, the General Federation of Women's Clubs had nearly a million members in 1910. <clears throat> the Daughters of the American Revolution, uh, one of Martha's favorite, almost doubled in size between 1910 and 1932, um, with 243 chapters and almost 17,000 members. And the prob uh, probably the greatest extent of women's club membership was between them all between the wars. Um, and the bottom photo is one of their um, general meetings and you can see the large number of women there. Oh, 
It was probably after she moved to Rochester that Martha became a committed Christian scientist. She'd been raised a Congregationalist, although her father sang in the choir of the Unitarian Church because he preferred their services. And she was married by, the, by a Congregational Minister. The local Westford newsletter described her as so, uh, so helpful a member of the church. Yet in Rochester, she attended the Second Christian Scientist Church on Seneca Parkway. Uh, it's now uh, Saint, oh, it's, it's not the uh, Christian Scientist Church now. Its proximity to her church, to her house, might have been the reason for her to explore the services. But what probably kept her attending was the church's emphasis on living a bold and compassionate life. She subscribed and occasionally contributed to the Christian Science Monitor and claimed sisterhood with Christian Science correspondents, notably Alma Lutz, Susan B. Anthony's biographer, who became a good friend. Martha noticed, quote, that she had accomplished all that I have according, all that I have according to the Chris, Christian Science principles. Her interest in Susan B. Anthony also began after she moved to Rochester. In 1942, she was elected president of the Rochester Federation of Women's Clubs, an organization that was founded by Susan B. Anthony. Her ele election was perhaps surprising since she'd been in Rochester only three years and was not on the executive board. She probably attended meetings as representative of the DAR. The board minutes for April 1942 noted that there were no nominations for president and quote, this was discussed and names submitted. So it looks as if the, the organization was really looking for leadership. Martha's energy, experience and intelligence would, would have been obvious. And hers must have been one of the names since by July, she was at chairing meetings as president. In a tour guide she wrote for the house, she claimed that quote, that her interest began when she was, quote, made president of the Federation of Women's Clubs and found that Susan B. Anthony had organized it in 1898 and that Miss Anthony had also been the first to propose that women be represented on the school board, something that would have been, would have resonated with her because her mother had also done that. Anthony appealed to her as a determined and patriotic woman hero whom she believed had been overlooked. In 1945, she told a Democrat and Chronicle reporter that after her move to Rochester, she, quote, started asking influential Rochesterials, which is what she called them at the time, why, some, why something was not done about memorizing Miss Anthony, perhaps the city's most outstanding woman citizen of its history, by taking over and maintaining her old house as a public shrine. Another reporter in 1957 quoted her saying, quote, when I came to Rochester and became president of the group whom Susan B. Anthony had founded and learned that people here didn't even know what her, where her home was, I knew something should be done. In the years after the 19th Amendment, public interest in Susan B. Anthony had waned. In Rochester, a tree was planted in her name in 1925, and in the same year, social reformer Helen Barrett Montgomery had urged the purchase of the house by local women's groups but nothing had happened. In 1929, under a headline, Grave Forgotten All But One, Susan B. Anthony's Birthday Passes, the Democrat and Chronicle reported that the own, only the male founder of the Susan B. Anthony Little Girls Club had laid a wreath. Admittedly, the February weather was bad. Rose Arnold Powell, who was until Martha Taylor Howard, the, um, world, the country's biggest booster of Susan, Susan B. Anthony, um, she was of the Minnesota Federate, uh, in Minnesota as the Federation of Women's Clubs. She was an ardent Anthony promoter, wrote to Martha that the General Federation of Women's Clubs had failed to build a, man, a memory, memorial to Anthony in Washington, D.C. in the 1920s. Qu and she, quote, I saw that a long campaign of education was necessary before women would be interested enough to support such an effort. Powell noted, noted that before his death in 1941, Gutson Borgham had agreed to calm Susan B. Anthony on Mount Rushmore. But, quote, I couldn't rouse women to, in time to care enough about the honor to work for it wholeheartedly. And then uh, Borgham died. She complained that women's organizations, quote, 
were too individualistic to work together as a unit and that, quote, our women pioneers spent a lifetime begging, pleading, appealing to men, unable to command anything. William B. Brown, the person responsible for the upkeep of the Susan B. Anthony birthplace in Adams, Massachusetts, wrote to Martha, quote, it is difficult here to get any appreciation of Miss Anthony in any way. That was the challenge Martha Taylor Howard faced. Her first initiative was to remind the public of Susan B. Anthony's former presence in Rochester. On May the 12th, 1944, the annual meeting of the Rochester Federation of Women's Clubs with Martha presiding, passed a resolution, quote, for the placing of a suitable wooden plaque at the house with Martha to, quote, see about the marker. This proved more difficult than she'd imagined since wartime shortages made wood in short, short supply and they had to compromise with, with Masonite. They dedicated the marker, marker in a short ceremony on October the 26th, 1944, with Florence Mosher, Susan B. Anthony's grandniece present. That's, that is Flo that's Florence Mosher. Now, uh, that is the Reverend David Rees Williams and the Florence Mosher in the picture. And that, that is the most Mason, Masonite plaque that they, uh, they produced. After the, uh, after the proceedings, Martha and five other women stayed behind under the horse chestnut tree outside on the verge. Uh, there it is on the left. Um, it's no lo sadly no longer there. Um, it died, but they have planted, there, there's another one planted to replace it. Um, they were talking about, quote, Miss Anthony's courage, perseverance, and devotion to a cause. The house owner, a widow who lived there with her son invited one of them, Grace Schneider, inside, where the house owner, where Grace discovered in conversation that they would like to sell the house, which was getting too much for them. Grace came out, collected a dollar from each of the women, and presented it to Martha in, quote, a lovely Roman striped silk container, telling her that it was a down payment for the house purchase and, she, and that she should organize it. That six dollars she had to. She wrote, Quote, it was a challenge. What should I do? Either I must give the money back or follow through and buy the house. In the face of all that Miss Anthony endured in her lifetime, I knew that I could not be cowardly and return the money. Here at last was a challenge worthy of her organizing skills and determination. She was nearly 70 years old. Martha took out a six month option to buy. The asking price was $8,500, which is about $123,000 today. The Federation of Women's Clubs agreed to incorporate the Susan B. Anthony House, no, the Susan B. Anthony Memorial Inc. The house was in good condition, but needed some repairs to the roof and gutters. Martha needed to raise about $10,000 for the purchase, repairs, painting, and conversion of the house into what she called a shrine. She was aware that there was a precedent for a women's organization owning a national site. The Mount Vernon Ladies Association owned and maintained George Washington's home in Virginia. I think they still do. Partially funded by nationwide donations collected by state vice regents. The vice regent for Massachusetts in the 1930s, Mrs. Nathaniel Taylor, lived close to Martha's family. And the previous Ma Massachusetts vice regent, Alice Longfellow, was a DAR member so Martha may have heard about Mount Vernon from them. However, the two were not really comparable. The Mount Vernon ladies had to raise $200,000 in the 1850s to secure the estate, far more than were required for the Susan B. Anthony purchase in the 1940s. Martha needed a local approach. Perhaps influenced by how the Christian Science Publishing Company had run a fund fundraising campaign, Martha went against her board's wishes and decided not to have what she called a drive, which meant people actively solicit, soliciting money door to door. Instead, quote, we would have no big social to start it off, but just announce the project in the papers and let the public know of the opportunity and the privilege that was theirs. Several times she reiterated, quote, I did not ask people for money. She wanted it to be a women's effort. Quote, the idea came to me that we would make use of women as far as possible. 
not to have a drive may have been a wise decision as there are already major campaigns to sell war bonds with the Rochester Federation of Women's Clubs heavily involved and the city was starting to raise funds with the community war memorial. However, the decision meant that Martha was personally responsible for most of the fundraising. A visitor to the house described Martha's methods. Quote, in asking for donations, Mrs. Howard wrote very clever letters. She told what others had done and then said, if you wish to consider a new kitchen sink or whatever, your name will of course be placed nearby. And the contributions came in in small amounts from individuals and larger ones from local organizations and businesses like the department scores and stores and McCurdy's and B. Foreman and the Rochester Business and Pref Professional Women's Club. For example, on May the 9th, 1945, the Memorial's treasurer, Willard Lushner, logged nine contributions ranging from single dollars to $10.85 from West High School to McCurdy's 150. Some potential local donors disappointed. Mrs. Frank Gannett, uh, Mrs. Frank Gannett thought people should support, quote, Aunt, Su Aunt Susan's active causes, although her husband Frank, newspaper magnet and owner of the two Rochester daily newspapers, contributed through the League of Women's Voters and was himself a strong supporter, giving free press coverage. Eleanor Gleason, wife of the head of the Gleason Corporation, declined to contribute as she thought the price for the house was too high and she didn't see how the house would be kept up, quote, without any assurance of support from the city or an organization. Kodak also refused to contribute, even though George worked for them. Martha reached out to surviving suffragists, uh, but was let down. Quote, I thought the project of buying the house would bring forth letters from people who work with Miss Anthony or whose relatives did, but that has not been the case. However, she had an ally in Cherry Captain Cat, the leader of the, uh, of the National Women's Suffrage Association when the 19th Amendment was passed, who collected contributions from the NWSA board, including $700 from the billionaire and major supporter of William, women's causes, Catherine McCormick. Mrs. Robert Anderson, chair of the Susan B. Anthony Memorial Committee of the National Women's Party, sent $100. Mrs. Ms. Pollitzer, the next chair of the committee, contributed 250 and later another hundred dollars to have the blinds painted but she seems to have been a little miffed telling Martha it should have been her her work that's Miss Pollitzer's to make the house here a memorial but since I had started it she felt it was her duty to help all she could financially. Eleanor Roosevelt sent a donation and wrote about the house in her newspaper column. In 1945 Martha took part in a national broadcast on women's issues over the over the Columbia Network, organization, organized by the National Federation of Women's Clubs, which may have helped to bring in national contributions. Yet Martha wrote to Cherry Catman Cat, quote, I think I know how Miss Anthony felt when she did not get quick success, but she never let herself get discouraged, I believe. So I too, uh, too I feel we will in the end get the money, but I wanted it to come in quicker. But her achievement was remarkable. By December 1945, they had raised enough money to make a payment of $5,000, take out a mortgage of $3,340, and receive the deed for the house. Uh, that is uh, William Newton of the Treasurer. Um, and uh, he uh, did he's getting the deed from the owner. Well, actually it's uh, the son of the owner. Uh, by the following December, they paid off the mortgage and had about $1,500 in hand. Carrie Chapman Cat sent the, la sent the last $700 ne dollars needed to pay off the mortgage, the remaining, uh, uh, which was the remaining balance in the million dollar fund Mrs. Frank Le Leslie had left her in 1914 to fund the suffrage campaign. The next hurdle was to renovate and furnish the interior. First, the previous owners had to move, which proved difficult in a post-war housing shortage. The Federation was finally able to take possession in October of 1946. 
Rather than trying to raise more money herself, Martha decided to ask local, state and national bodies to fund the renovation of particular rooms. Uh, the department store B. Foreman, the Women's Alliance of the Unitarian Church, the State Department of the Women's Relief Corporation, some of Susan B. Anthony's relatives, the classroom teachers of Rochester, the Business and Professional Women of New York, the National Association of New England Women, the University of Rochester Women Alumni, and the board of the National Association for Women's Suffrage all came forward. People and organizations also donated furnishings, books, and other materials. Carrie Chapman Catt donated the desk on which she had drafted the 19th Amendment and her personal collection of over 125 framed portraits of women suffrage, suffragists. After buying and furnishing the house, the next task was securing its upkeep at an estimated co cost of $1,000 a year. Here, Martha was less su successful. At first, she hoped that another organization would take it over, telling, uh, initially telling the Federation's committee that, quote, after we purchase the home, we will turn it over to the Rochester Museum. Mr. Parker, who was the museum head, says that they will maintain it, paying all costs. We will be custodians. This can be worked out later to the satisfaction of everything, everyone, but it didn't happen. She approached the New York State Historical Society, the Rochester Historical Society, the Landmark Society, and the city of Rochester. They all expressed support for her work, but none would take it on. It was going to be up to the Susan B. Anthony Memorial and Martha, its president, to do it. She decided to aim for an endowment of $100,000, Carrie Chapman Catt thought that was far too ambitious, but Martha sh stood firm. She was reluctant to charge admission to the house, but instead created what she called a living endowment plan, whereby people all over the country paid membership fees of up to $5 to the Memorial Fund. Catt warned her of the poverty of old suffragists. Quote, I think there are at least two board members who find it a very serious matter to even pay a small membership fee. However, in the year 1959 to 60, there were 500 members. In 1945 to 46 alone, Martha sent out 94 letters re requesting support uh, and she kept carbon copies of all of them. She did not give up hope of last, large donations. She constantly wrote letters to people she'd identified as potential donors. Um, these included John D. Rockefeller, Elizabeth Arden and Betty Davis, though none kept the bait and uh, took the bait. And she also kept a file of obituaries of wealthy people um, that she could write to. The Carnegie and Ford Foundations turned her down, but she did receive two significant donations. Harry Chapman Catt had kept NWSA going because they would eventually receive a bequest from Catt, the, the Catherine Boyles Fund. And when that money became in, available in 1948, the board voted to contribute $1,000 to the memorial. In 1950, Susan B. Anthony's birthplace in Adams, Massachusetts was sold and the house received $3,000 from the proceeds. But there were some major disappointments. Two of Martha's strongest supporters, Carrie Chapman Catt and Mrs. Robert Anderson, led her to believe they would remember the house in their wills, but they both died suddenly in 1947 without doing so. Uh, Mrs. Anderson in a traffic uh, accident and Catt from, um, from a heart attack. The Memorial Committee planned to open the house to the public for the first time with what was called a silver tea on February the 14th, 1947, uh, close to Susan B. Anthony's birthday. Um, silver meant that they got out uh, silver teapots and all that sort of thing. It, quote, everything was in place the night before except Carrie Chapman's portrait, Cat's portraits, which had not arrived. In the afternoon, Martha gave a broadcast about the house on WHAM and arrived home to find that the pictures would be delivered at 6 p.m. She, her son, and the GI living in the house set to work at one, uh, who was the kind of who was custodian, set to work at once and had almost all of them hung by 10:15. Uh, they, if you go to the house now, they they're no longer uh, hanging because the uh, theme of the displays has changed. 
but they are all in uh, two boxes in the archive. On the day of the tea, more than 400 people came and they had to call the police to help with the traffic. Uh, they also had managed to get um, Madison Street paved not long before this. Martha wore her, quote, handsome bombazine of my mother's with a train. Um, she's not very visible there in, in the picture. Uh, she's at the back. Uh, the, per um, uh, the person who is sort of thrown, uh, right by the marker on the left, uh, that is Susan B. Anthony II, who is another of Susan B. Anthony's grand, grand niece, and she's unveiling the marker. On June, June, July the 22nd, as part of the celebrations commemorating the centenary, the 1848 Seneca Fort Falls Women's Convention, the memorial held a tea and dedication ceremony for a state marker designating the house as a historic landmark in the presence of Susan Marie Anthony II, the suffragist's great niece. They also hosted an exhibit for their 100th anniversary, although there were, there were still signs of a lack of interest in Susan Marie Anthony. Rose Arnold Powell thought that, that it was partly because Anthony had not attended Seneca Falls. Alma Lutz wrote that she was having trouble finding a publisher for her biography. Quote, publishers have decided that they don't want Susan because they say there's a reaction against women and a book about her won't sell. Martha was not deterred. She was tireless in her promotion of Miss Anthony in the house, writing letters to the local newspapers on every conceivable occasion that could have some bearing of them, and making sure the house events were well publicized. I mean, you know, every um, politician's birthday, you could be sure that there would be something in the Democrat and Chronicle that uh, told, uh, that linked it in some way to Susan B. Anthony. Um, and the, uh, the, the editors of both the Democrat and Chronicle and the Times Union uh, were knew, knew about her and they tended, they tended to publish her letters. In 1946, Martha stepped down as chair of the Rochester Association of Women's Clubs, but continued to be president of the Mor Memorial until her death. Her last major campaign was to get Susan B. Anthony elected to the Hall of, Fames of, uh, Hall of Fame of Great Americans. Uh, and you um, maybe uh, may wonder what on earth that is. Um, it was an outdoor uh, sculpt sculpture gallery in the, in the Bronx. Uh, it's still there. It was funded in 1900 by Helen Gould, the um, heiress daughter of the Robert, Robert Baron, Jane, Jay Gould. Um, Martha met Helen Gould once when she was in New York, and it was designed by Stanford, the famous architect Stanford White. It, um, it was an, uh, a good ongoing proposition in the 1950s, uh, but uh, it, it basically ran out of money. Um, the last person to um, be inducted was uh, Franklin, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1933, and it took them several years to get a bust up of him. Um, and it actually ran out of money um, in 1977, uh, and there has been some fundraising. It, it, when, when it was first set up, it was on a campus of New York University um, in the Bronx, but New York University was um, running out of money and they sold it uh, to the City University of New York. And it is now Bronx Community, is now Bronx Community College. Elections to the Hall of Fame took place every five years. In 1950, there were 118 electors representing every state. As soon as B. Anthony had been nominated several times before, the latest in 1945, when she received 40, 40 votes. 
Uh, Martha launched a campaign blitz, getting as many people as possible to write letters to the electors, providing them with a form letter. Uh, in, the archive, in her archive, there are large numbers of uh, examples of this form letter that she uh, sent out to people. No woman had been elected uh, to the Hall of Fame for 30 years, so she made sure to contact national women's organizations like the Women's Christian Temperance Union, as well as her reg regular supporters like the DAR. This time she was successful. Susan B. Anthony received 72 votes out of 186 in third place, beating Theodore Roosevelt and uh, Thoreau didn't even make the cut. With typical modesty, Martha told local journalist Arch Merrill, please do not give me any credit about this election. Let it all go to the Susan B. Anthony Memorial Line, Inc. I was just the instrument. She was actually a little chagrined when the National Federation of Business Professionals volunteered to raise the money for the necessary bus, and she was not involved. And she didn't attend the ceremony, but sent a bouquet of golden gladioli, suffrage color. The city of Rochester sent lilacs from the Susan B. Anthony Bush in Highland Park. Later in 1961, when it, while in New York to attend a ceremony, where Martha was presented with a medallion at the 38th Annual Women's International Expedition for, quote, her work in preserving and maintaining the Susan B. Anthony House as a historical place of national importance. She went to the Hall of Fame then with two companions to lay a wreath. During the 1950s, Martha poured her energy into promoting the interests, visibility and funding of the house. Her grandson, Mark, suggested that she was also involved in the 1955 successful petition campaign to prevent liquor sales at the newly completed, completed what rushed the War Memorial Arena. And the ban, uh, the ban it was a successful um, ban, and the ban actually lasted for 10 years. I can't find any evidence of her being involved for that in her archive uh, or on the Democrat and Chronicle, but it's certainly plausible. She received numerous awards for her activism, including Woman of the Year from the Russian Femination of Women, Women's Clubs, the Gold Medal of Honor from the National Society of New, uh, New England Women, the Medallion of Honor at the Women's International Exposition, where she was lauded as, quote, an inspiring example of the true spirit of American pa patriotism, and the Good Citizen Medicine Medal from the Rochester Sons of the American Revolution. Um, in one of those weird his, uh, things that historians come across, uh, she preserved the program for this uh, the ceremony for the Good Citizen Medal, and uh, it contains a, a biography of her. And uh, it says that she taught English at Western College in Ohio, which she didn't. She taught psychology, and it sh says that she met her husband there, who was a professor. Both of those things were totally untrue. And I do wonder what, she, what, what it was like for her to sit there um, with the, with um, whether she protested that these things were untrue. And anyway, how they got this uh, false information. And the only explanation I can think of is that she had appalling handwriting. And she wrote out uh, the, 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 uh, the details of her biography and they couldn't read them properly. In an interview, uh, the, a reporter described her, quote, Mrs. Howard speaks in cultured New England accents, and you associate her manner with teacups on the knee, crocheted do do doilies, and antimacassars. But don't let that fool you. The lady, lady is as purposeful as an ICBM missile. She also made sure that other, others received awards. An interview in 1957 li lists six people she has successfully nominated for awards, including prominent local woman, Mrs. Harper Sibley for Mother of the Year. In the 1950s, she also, she also enjoyed her grandchildren. Her son, George Jr. married Eileen Kern, a World War II veteran and nurse in 1949, and they had four children. Um, all of whom I have been in contact with. Mark, remem remem Mark her, her, second, uh, her second grandson, 
remembers each grandchild getting their own week with their grandmother and also attending children of the American Revolution meetings. Christine, her, the only granddaughter, remembers the occasion when she and her older brother Bill dressed in colonial costumes and presented a bouquet to the state regent of the DAR annual conference at the house. Martha wrote in her Christmas letter for 1961, Anne, um, who, would, who well, that was her original name, but she later became Christine, did the correct curtsy and presented the bouquet and Bill did the correct bow and it gave them experience. A Christian science, scientist optimist, Mar Martha recorded few complaints. In 1950, she noted that her income, quote, her income had been much reduced. She felt unable to chair the annual meeting in 1954. Quote, I have not been feeling well and I've not come back as fast as I had hoped for. The, the minutes showed that that was the only occasion she missed chairing a meeting um, of all the time until her death. In 1955, she wrote about, quote, problems for me this winter and spring, which were very difficult. And some of them were unknown to anyone, for I did not want to burden anyone. The house funding continued to be a worry. In 1960, there was no money to pay $25 dues to the National Trust for the preservation of historic places. In that year, the endowment fund stood at over $7,000, far short of the goal she had envisioned. She wanted 100,000. Martha also paid attention to politics. Since the 1920s, the DAR had promoted, quote, defense against external enemies, anti-pacifism and anti-communism. Following the lead of the DAR, she developed a dislike of the United Nations and by association, Eleanor Roosevelt, fearing that the UN might, quote, be a way of taking us over and having us lose the freedoms we have. I am suspicious of it. Elsewhere, she described it as potentially a gigantic dictatorship. She was also somewhat infected with the Red Scare of the 1950s. She thought the League of Women Voters had been infiltrated by communists. Quote, I'm a real patriot and I am against all this infiltration. I know all about the subversive work and how people are hoodwinked. But her surviving letters include few personal opinions. She insisted that, quote, I try to think no unkind thoughts of others and I like harmony. And, quote, I like to live 1 Corinthians 13 chapter on love. She maintained, I have a strong feeling that women should emphasize the great qualities which Ms. Anthony had. Patience, courage, perseverance, faith, cheer, leadership, etc. We need to bring out those qualities to counteract all the emphasis on the glamour of the movie stars as though beauty and dress were the essentials instead of the inner grace of the soul. Her harshest criticism was referred for her heroine's great niece, Susan B. Anthony II. Uh, she criticized her for her membership of, in the Congress of Women, an organization which Martha said was, quote, against our form of government. If, I'd known, if I had known as much about her as, her, her as I now know, I would not have invited her to unveil the marker in 1948. In a letter to a, tr to a trusted uh, fellow Christian scientist, Alma Lutz, describing the great niece's visit with a friend, she went further in her disapproval. They were both, quote, they were both smoking cigarettes, neither had on stockings. Miss A had toeless shoes and her toenails were stained a deep red as were her fingernails, high lip coloring. But such criticism for few. In May 1962, when Martha was 86, she participated in the annual DAR ceremony at Susan B. Anthony's grave on Memorial Day, making remarks, laying the wreath, and another one for the War of 1812 soldiers. In June, she attended her 65th Mount Holyoke class reunion. But on July the 11th, she suffered a stroke and was taken to Rochester General Hospital, where she died. Her granddaughter remembered. Her, her granddaughter re remembered that as a Christian scientist, 
she was very upset at, have, at having been taken to a hospital. Her obituary described her as a defender of patriotism and people, a gentle or soft-spoken little lady, hardly what you'd call an aggressive type, but a real tiger when it came to causes to which she was tirelessly de dedicated. The Irondequoit chapter of the DAR called her the Susan B. Anthony of our time. Uh, and the minutes of the Susan B. Anthony Memorial in September uh, de be bemoaned the loss of their, of their leader. And Martha Taylor Howard was uh, typical of, in many ways, typical of her time, um, a club woman, um, but uh, very, but very determined. Uh, per perhaps uh, a, rel a relic of her uh, her New England upbringing, and the Susan B. Anthony House is her memorial. Okay. Now I'm going to end um, that. There's her gravestone in Westford, manufacture. Uh, Matt Massachusetts. I'm going to end the slideshow um, and I'm going to get back. Uh, I have a brief, uh, I have a recording of uh, Martha's voice, um, which I hope is going to work. Come on. Be patient for just a minute. I'm not getting it to work. Maybe happening. When I was president of the Rochester Federation of Women's Clubs, which Miss Anthony organized, I felt there should be a little track at her home here in Rochester so people would know where she lived. It was during the World War II, and you couldn't get bronze markers in. So I proposed to the Federation that we get a little Masonite marker, put it on the stage and put it between the two front windows of her home at 17 Madison Street. And the woman who lived here was quite willing that we should do that. Then we came here uh, October 26, 1945, and had the ceremony of unveiling this tablet, we'll call it. And the minister of the Unitarian Church came to make the dedicatory prayer. And two of Miss Anthony's grandnieces were here and others. After we had our little ceremony, we went into the house and saw it. And the woman who lived here said to one of those women, this house is too big for me. I've been here 27 years and I'd like to sell it. 
So this woman came out onto the porch and a few other women around there, and she took a one dollar bill out of her pocketbook and said, I'll give one dollar to those buying the house who will match my dollar. And there were five women who each handed her a one dollar bill, and she turned and handed me the six dollars, and she said, now buy the house. But that was a challenge, and I had to go through a hand back the money to the women. Well, after mulling it over for a while, I got the Federation to vote to buy this house. And we went to Okay. So just a taste of what she looks like. And now, uh, how about your any comments and uh, suggestions? When I was president of the Rochester Federation oh, of Women's College, it's very difficult to get this to stop. Organized, I felt that there should be a little flat at her home here in Rochester. I think I have. So we've had one question come up in the chat. And that was asking, why was W. Stephen Thomas, the RMSC director, in the July 1948 photo? Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't have an absolutely accurate answer uh, for that, but uh, she did invite uh, people from all the local museums to, uh, to come for the ceremony. Um, it, it was a big day in Rochester generally for um, celebrating the Seneca Falls uh, Convention. Um, and uh, she was also still trying to get support from local museums without much success. So I suspect that's why he's in there. That's the only question we've received thus far. Does anyone have any other questions to add in? or comments or? I, I mean, I understand that there's not a, not a lot of things to discuss about her life. Um, and uh, there, there are a lot of the, quite a lot of things that I would like to know more about. Um, her, um, her grandson, Mark, does have some more, uh, some more um, documents, uh, but they're unfortunately in his uh, garage, in, uh, buried under a whole lot of other stuff in his garage in um, Washington, D.C., so uh, there's no way I can, I can get at them. Uh, he has sent me a couple of uh, things. And it's been, um, when I gave this talk first at the Susan B. Anthony House, um, Mark and Jim, the youngest grandson, and a great, uh, Rosie, his great, uh, Martha's great grandchild, who she didn't ever know, um, all, atten all attended uh, the talk, which was, which was fun. Okay, thank you, Linda. Are there any other questions? Well, I thank you all for coming and listening. Um, I'm clearly I've made you speechless. Well, everyone, thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank you, Dr. Lloyd, for this very in-depth and very interesting presentation about a very much overlooked Rochesterian. Thank you very much, everybody.